Hi there, everyone. Thank you for waiting. Again, I'm Max, and I'd like to thank you on behalf of Romans Bookstore for tuning into today's Indie Bookstore event. Today, we're lucky to have with us Gail Brandis, who will be hosting the incredible author Deanne Stillman, and they'll be talking about her book, 29 Palms. And with us, we also have Tony Gokison, who's a singer-songwriter, and who will be debuting some new songs based on 29 Palms. So I will go ahead and let them take over now. Thank you all so much. Yes, thank you so much. And I'm going to give the introduction I gave earlier for those who might have just joined us. I'm so delighted to be here on Independent Bookstore Day. I love independent bookstores. They, have, they give so much to the community. They give so much to readers and writers. And let's what, do what we can to support them and celebrate them every day. Um, and I'm also just so delighted to be here to celebrate the 20th anniversary of Deanne Stillman's incredible book, 29 Palms, A True Story of Murder, Marines, and the Mojave. And she's also the book, uh, or, <laughs> excuse me, also the author of a number of other gorgeous books, Blood Brothers, The Story of the Strange Friendship Between Sitting Bull and Buffalo Bill, Desert Reckoning, A Town Sheriff, A Mojave Hermit, and The Biggest Manhunt in Modern California History, Mustang, The Saga of the Wild Horse in the American West, and Joshua Tree, Desolation Tango. And I first read and was utterly blown away by 29 Palms when it came out almost 20 years ago, and was just as blown away when I reread it recently. The cult classic, which been, has been called the In Cold Blood of Our Time, and was an LA Times Best Book of the Year, is a clear-eyed love letter to the majesty of the desert, as well as a meticulously researched, compassionate exploration of the violence that's always been part of the Mojave, centered around the brutal murder of two young women by a troubled Marine recently returned to the local base from the Gulf War. While 29 Palms does a deep dive into the families and communities impacted by these horrific murders, Stillman also unpacks what their stories have to say about the violence and empty promises of America itself. Stillman is a visionary. She was writing about nomads long before the celebrated nomad land and explored rape culture and America's class divide in her work long before these subjects became an integral part of our wider cultural conversation. This book, which was optioned to the producer of The Old Man and the Gun with Robert Redford, yay, has had an impact in so many profound ways, not least of which being it helped police make a 20-year-old cold rape case against the Marine doing time for the murders of Mandy and Rose, the young woman Stillman writes about in 29 Palms. Stillman is also working on a stage production of 29 Palms, and we're so lucky to have her collaborator, noted singer-songwriter Tony Gilkison, who's played with X and the Dave Alvin Band, as well as recording his own solo albums. Tony has written songs inspired by 29 Palms for this production and is going to share some of them with us today. So Tony, if you could please start us off with Mirage. I'll give it my best shot. <laughs> Strong enough to walk to the sea. The light of the moon will guide you and me. Shines on the back of a broken bus and plays with us. Rusted cars that lay in peace. Empty cans. Buckshot trees. All that is past is all to the east. And there lies the sea. I dreamed it was all I hoped it would be. Fathers who sank like the sun below the horizon before we could run. And where are they now to see how we've done and why 
did they leave? Let the night crawl into our bones. I'll share my shirt and a secret. We'll walk to where the waters are home. And all that's beneath it. I dreamed it was all I hoped it would be. Cause I'm not alone. I There's a mirage to guide Beautiful. Thank you so much, Tony, for sharing that. Oh my gosh. I have chills. Thank you. All right. So, Deanne, you write about the desert with such a finely observant eye. I love the way you're able to explore the flora and fauna and the geological history of the place. And I was wondering if you could read a short passage about the desert before we get started. Yeah, I'd like to, Gail, and thank you so much for, um, you know, your lovely introduction. And again, big thank you to Tony Gilgeson for that gorgeous song. Um, this is, this is an, um, an excerpt from the, uh, prologue called Prelude to a Kill. The concern here is the Mojave Desert, the dry baptismal font of national consciousness, mythological birthplace of America. It takes a big white-hearted desert to fuel the pursuit of happiness, vast stretches of, of what, emptiness, <laughs> to suggest that the world can be possessed like an oyster extreme tableaus of beauty to obliterate all memory of bad news. Have a nice day, the Mojave Desert tells the crossing parade, the Donner Party, the seekers of buried treasure, the cowboys, the ranchers, the people who rush for Hollywood gold. Good luck, think positive. Called the Mojave Desert after the Native Americans who once lived there, this blank sunny slate bears a name that has defied the plundering of linguists, the meaning of the original term Kamakov, long ago swept away by the Santa Ana winds, that strange atmospheric condition born in the desert which raises the skin on all living creatures and is said to warn of earthquakes. But the mysterious name fits, the unknowable is unnameable too. The Mojave was here before California, Nevada, and Arizona planted their flags in it, and it will be here tomorrow. Not that it's keeping track of time, History doesn't matter out here. It's space that counts, space that drives the country, space that suggests the possibility of declaring bankruptcy and starting over somewhere else, space that maintains the illusion of hitting the jackpot on some get-rich-quick scheme, space that whispers, 
make bombs and bring down the government all by yourself. In a weird bakery of the impossible, a vast scape of tortured beauty where all things are equal and do what is necessary to survive. Personal demons aren't demons at all, but just some other creatures who need a drink. Beautiful. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so sure. much for sharing that. And I wonder if you could talk a bit about what drew you to the desert and what drew you to this story. Well, I, I've been wandering the desert since before I saw it. I started as a little girl. Um, my father used to read his favorite authors to me. And one of them was Edgar Allan Poe. And uh, a poem that he loved was, loved was El Dorado. And um, I just used to love hearing it. It was very enchanting. And, and there's that refrain, which many people remember, gaily bedight a gallant night in sunshine and in shadow had wandered along singing a song in search of El Dorado. And I, I just was really drawn into that poem. And I actually, started fantasizing a, what I later realized was a Joshua tree, even though I had never seen one. Um, there was a lot of turmoil in my household growing up. Um, when I never, have you ever had the feeling that you maybe were born in the wrong place or you're living in the wrong terrain? I mean, I think a lot of people relate to that. And I just, I never liked cold weather. Um, so growing up in northeastern Ohio just didn't ring my chimes. I don't like ice fishing. Um, I do like rock and roll, and Cleveland is kind of garage band central. Uh, but I just, I didn't feel, I never quite felt comfortable there. And um, then when my parents, so I started, let me backtrack for a second. I started living inside this, this that poem for a number of reasons. It just really it was an escape, you know, it took me out across the uh, mesas and through the red rock canyons and so on. And my mother had horses when I was growing up and she taught me to ride when I was a little girl and that kind of fueled my wanderlust. And then when my parents got divorced, um, I really fully engaged with that poem and other literature of the West as a, you know, going deeper into this escape. I mean, I was, I would imagine myself, um, you know, living in the West and and um, riding with with some of my literary hero, literary and literary heroes and, and the great outlaws of you know American history and running across, running into um, you know into this vast horizon and, and starting over, which of course is the great American promise. And um, my mother had gotten, my mother's most immediately marketable skill after my parents got divorced was horseback riding. And she got a job on the racetrack as one of the first, it turned out she was one of the first women in the country to ride professionally as an exercise boy, as they used to call them. And I would go to the track with her in the mornings and hang out and we would meet all these you know, all the misfits of of, uh, of the world, all these amazing characters on the track circuit. And they kind of became like our new uh, universe. Um, and I really kind of identified them because we had become out, we moved from a, the right side of the tracks to the wrong side of the tracks. And even some of our relatives stopped talking to us because we lived in the wrong part of town at that point. So I identified with all, all these, people and um years later when i mo physically moved to the west you know where i had which i had been longing for for a long time and i started um hiking in the desert um i uh, one day after a hike i went into uh, a bar in 29 palms called the josh inn and i heard people gossip i heard some locals gossiping about two girls who had been quote unquote sliced up by a marine and by then i knew i knew there was much more to the story i i knew some of the kids in town and i knew that the 29 palms was headquarters of the world's largest marine base and that there was you know that there were a lot of 
kind of misfits and and um castaways living in the desert and so on and along with you know a lot just a very wide range of people and hearing that hearing hearing that statement was very upsetting and i asked i said well who were the girls and then somebody said oh just some trash in town and that upset me even more and i just it just really you know as i've said to people before um it the whole thing rang me like a church bell on D-Day. I mean, I just like had to go in and find out what that story was. And I wanted to to say, say the names of these girls, like who were they and what were their stories? And it just, the whole thing just wasn't right. I mean, to me, as I later learned, they were, they are, they were American patriots. They were collateral damage in, in every sense of that term. So, I spent the next 10 years, you know, learning the story of what happened there. And um, here I am. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, you honor their story so powerfully. And I so appreciate you giving, you know, their, their story the respect it deserves and letting people know, you know, their names and their stories. It, it's uh, it's so powerful. And you mentioned starting over. And I know, you know, both Mandy and Rose found their way to the desert as a way of starting over, um, you know, in different ways. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about their families and what brought both of them to the desert. Well, like a lot of us, they came, they did come to California. Their families did come to California to start over and live the dream. Um, uh, Debbie's family came west uh, with a Donner party. And um, they obviously made the correct turn at Hastings Cut because, you know, the, her family survived and, and they settled in Sonora. And um, that's where she and she and her family <clears throat> grew up and um then she she um uh had befriended bikers at, during the um i'd say 1970s and so on and uh ended up you know on a pretty rough road there uh through through friendships with the hell's angels and so on and um but what, in order to extricate herself from all that, ended up moving to the Mojave to, to start over, as you're saying. As you know, the desert really does, it is California, and specifically our wide open space is really the great American promise. I mean, you can go out to the Mojave or any number of other places and, and stake a claim or reinvent yourself or, you know, stop talking to people or, or tell everyone you want to be known as water district judy and it's just you know it, it, it's all fine and um she wanted to raise her family there and and ran and you know collided with the marines and she her you know there were there were members of the military in her own family vietnam vets and so on and, and and i think people tend to a lot of people tend to misunderstand the military in this country it's they support quite a lot of people and um um you know, they're quite a, it's quite an amazing family. Um, Rosalie Ortega, the other uh, murder victim, it was Mandy Scott, was a, the, the, the girl who was killed the night before her 16th birthday. And the other one was her friend, Rosalie Ortega, whose family came from the Philippines. And she grew up in a shack in, a, in, a, in the Philippines. Um, very, they were very poor. Her mother married... Um, uh, a member, a soldier in the army as a way out of the Philippines and the military does serve as a way out for a lot of people, you know, in the Philippines, I think that that's not a secret, but then they, the idea was to come to California and start over. And, um, they did. And they, they too ended up in, in the Mojave and specific, specifically 29 Palms. But I, can I read a passage? I want to read a passage Please. about um, Rosie's arrival in um, in America and, and, and what what that meant to her. First, let me backtrack into their 
what life was like for them in this in their um in the Philippines. Even by local standards, getting by was a struggle. Five people now lived in a one-room jungle shack made from logs, logs, batang left by timber crews. They slept on bamboo mats. There was no electricity and meals were cooked outside on rocks. There was no running water. The Kalampang River, a few hundred yards away, supplied drinking water, fish for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And it was also where the family bathed and washed clothes. Some people in Batangas were considered well-to-do. They had generators, which provided not only artificial light, but power for television sets. Sometimes Jessalyn and her younger sister, Rosalie, would pay 10 centavos to stand outside a neighbor's window and watch Happy Days. They fantasized about living in the States, although they had no idea what it looked like there. They wanted to dress like Chachi. In Manila, Juanita was going to seamstress school and they sent back money and handmade articles of clothing when she was able. But there was no disguising the fact that Jessalyn, Rosalie, and, and Ray were the poorest kids in, the, in their neighborhood. At school, the kids made fun of their threadbare garb. So that was a situation in the Philippines. And now here, here was what happened. Um, uh, Jessalyn, who was the um, younger sister of Rosalie, the, Mandy's friend who was killed at the same on the night of the murders I write about. Um, I describe her coming to America. The first leg of her trip, a 15 hour flight, took Jessalyn to San Francisco. Her connecting flight to Atlanta, the second leg, was, was late, and the dazed little girl wandered the airport, hungry, scared, and not knowing how to talk to anyone at the dozens of concession, concession stands which offered treats to those who, who spoke English. A young Marine on his way to Okinawa spotted Jessalyn as she stood before the Burger King counter. He read her tag. She was wearing a name tag that said, if, I, if you find me, my name is Jessalyn Ortega. Um, realized that she was part of a Marine family, took her hand and sat her down in a booth under the harsh white light of the Burger Emporium. He left for a few minutes and returned with a whopper urging Jess, Jesslyn to unfurl the wrapping. She stared warily at the peculiar packaged item. It smelled funny and she crinkled her nose. Look, he said, this is how you do it. He began to remove the paper and as soon as Jesslyn caught another whiff, she threw up. Then she started crying. He cleaned up the mess and tried to calm the foreign traveler, not knowing that she was used to fish and rice and that the smell of dead meat, her first meal in her new home, made her sick. You'll be okay, he told her as he waited with her at the gate, perhaps thinking of his own new life in Okinawa, perhaps calming himself. Everything will be fine. Thank you so much for sharing those passages. Such a, a powerful look at the tender specificity of your detail. It's just so beautiful the way you take us into the lives of the people you write about. I'm so grateful. Thank you. And I wonder if now would be a good time for Tony to share the um, the Motel 6 song since we're talking about the migration of the families. And I know that, um, that Debbie, Mandy's mother, you know, had them at various Motel 6s along the way. Um, Tony, are you there? I'm here. <laughs> Great. In trailer on the land, she follows a man with the bruises of love barely healed. Any road she goes down to another prison town, the fate of blood is soon to be sealed. Women will sit in a room deeply lit, 
and speak of trails to fix through any open door the table holds court under a big red sense. you better look up if you can't go further down there's a laugh rising from the ground for the women tumbleweeds, the road sometimes leads under a big red six. Angel taps the door, her slippers on the floor, with a pimple as little as a fist. For money if you have any, there's a foil and a twenty, and favors too many to list. And the TV will light, a lonely motel night, and crickets hide under the bricks. And make an evening sound till the sun hits the ground for the women of the big red sex. You better look up if you can't go further down. There's a laugh rising from the ground for the women in tumbleweeds. Sometimes we under the big red sex. We did. Oh, there we go. Okay. One more song. Yes. That was, yeah, that was that was fabulous. Thank you so much, Tony. And before we go on, I just want to uh, just share with the audience the sort of interesting resonance that Dan's books have have had in my life. Um, a few years ago, I was invited to review her book, Desert Reckoning, for the Los Angeles Review of Books. And I was so happy to be asked to review it because I loved her work. And as I was reading it, I realized I actually knew someone in the book, not well, we had crossed paths a couple of times. And it was just wild to see this person I had met as a, a you know just really tragic figure in this book. And then there have been other connections with other books. Um, I met my husband when we performed in our Riverside production of Annie Get Your Gun together. And so the, the um, book about Buffalo Bull and Sitting Bull has that resonance since they're both in Annie Get Your Gun. Um, and with this book, 29 Palms, uh, you know, I used to live in Riverside, and so I'm very familiar with the desert. It's a place I used to spend quite a bit of time in, and so had that connection. But also I now live in Lake Tahoe, which is near the Donner Pass, and the fact that one of the characters, the real-life characters, of course, had, um, you know, a connection to the Donner Party just felt like a really interesting resonance. And in terms of our own work, my most recent book is told in the voices of girls and women who were killed by Countess Bathory around the turn of the 17th century. And delving into that painful history of torture and murder took an emotional toll at times. And I would love to hear you talk about the emotional toll of writing this book. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question, Galen. And, and I know you're familiar with this emotional terrain and thanks for bringing it up. Um, so this story, as as most of you know, is about two girls who were killed by a, a Marine shortly after the Gulf War in a very brutal fashion. 
and um, uh, going deep inside the, the stories of both of the girls and their families was, you know, I it was mind blowing actually, and, and at times extremely distressing. Um, and sometimes I had to just stop and step away because it was just it was too much to bear and. Fortunately for me, I could escape from 29 Palms. I didn't, I wasn't stranded there. I could go back to the beach. I didn't have to to uh, immerse myself in that world, really. Although, the, as I told you, I, I there was this calling and I couldn't really resist it. Um, but resist I did for a while. I mean, I would, there were just too many upsetting things that I had found out and I had stepped away for a couple of months and, and I, that happened round about the time I was actually writing about the night of the murders. I just, I just could not bear it anymore. And um, um, I was sitting at the Rose Cafe one day after a Dodger game, you know, it could not have been like a more idyllic afternoon. And um, as I was sipping my coffee, I hear a, a car screech to a halt in front of the cafe, and then I then I hear a woman sc screaming, "My babies, my babies!" And a car door is slamming, and then the the car takes off, something like that. And I and it, uh, instantly I thought, "That sounds like a muscle car." And then I flashed on the desert. I mean, there was heavy metal blasting from the car, and so on. There were a number of cues I was getting. And I rushed out to look, and there was a a battered woman who had been flung to the sidewalk, clutching a teddy bear. Mm -hmm. And it was just unbelievable. And I could just barely make out the plates on the guy's car. I could see it was a man in the driver's seat, and the plates said Joshua Tree. And I thought, like, oh, for God's sake, the desert. I can't get away. From, cannot get away from this story. I've got to. It's. It's coming back for me and it's demanding that I finish the book. And at that point I was like six or seven years in. Um, so, so re-engage I did. I mean, it, but it was, it really was like the desert had, had come and gotten me once again, it was a desert in the first place. And, it, and then it was like, Hey, don't forget about me and us. And, you know, all of the, the thing about, the land that resonates for me, that, you know, that particular part of the country is that it, it's misunderstood. Like a lot of people who live there, it's not, it's not taken care of like a lot of animals, you know, it, the whole place is recorded as a castaway people in it, animals, you know, it's the other, it's all about the other, this, you know, that this story is all about the other. Um, what we do to the land, what we do to ourselves ultimately, and what's happening with the people who, who, who how are we treating, you know, all of these people who are um, cast off and, and what's that all about? So, so yeah, that was, um, that was a real turning point for me in writing this book, the day the desert came and got me. <laughs> and then I'll, story if we have, I'll take a, like a couple of other minutes because this is like truly and this is like a, a really magical story um well that was too actually um when I finally finished my book and I had all the um pages printed out and I had hired an editor on the outside to work with me because I wasn't really getting along with my editor at the publishing house the original uh publisher at William Morrow was William Morrow and I just didn't I had been through several editors because it takes me so long. It was taking me so long that people had come and gone and like, you know, global warming, global cooling. There had been like all these geologic changes. And finally they were going, you better turn that book in. And um, so I picked up my manuscript and it was all marked up and I was going to input the changes, that, you know, on my computer that, that night and turn the book in the next day. And um, I put the manuscript on top of my car in the editor's driveway and I pulled out onto Wilshire, Wilshire Boulevard and I forgot to put it back into my car. <laughs> and um, a storm was gathering 
really like a you know a freak thunderstorm over Santa Monica and it was it the sky was growing black and these gigantic hailstones were coming down and huge raindrops I mean it was like an act of God and then I look I hear this whoosh sound and look out my car window and the my manuscript pages are flying off the top of my car and I'm like, oh my god 10 years of work there it goes and so I screeched to a halt and I run it was rush hour and I start ru running into traffic to grab pages and then a woman in a jeep screeches to a halt you have all these cars cars screeching to a halt in my life I think anyway so this woman in, in a Jeep comes to a halt and she goes, you look like you need help, may I help you? I said, yes, my manuscript is flying away. So she stops traffic, buses, and there were like police cars and other, you know, like you name it. And so she, so while I'm, she's holding everyone at bay while I'm retrieving pages, which are blowing down Wilshire towards the beach and is thundering. And then a homeless woman with a grocery cart comes out of the mist. And she's like trundling towards me with her cart and says, may I help you? You look like you need help. And I went, look at my manuscript, my manuscript. And so she's like darting in and out of traffic with her cart and like really like pulling pages down from between drops and grabbing them as they're flying down towards the beach. And I just, so there we were, the three of us trying to like save my manuscript. This was all happening very fast. And finally, the woman with the cart comes back to me with a stack of pages, like the, the, almost the entire manuscript. And there, I still have it. There are tire tread marks all over it and everything. And she hands it. She goes, well, I think, I, I think this is it. And I, and I just, like, burst into tears. And then I followed her off the road and, or in, you know, over to the curb. And I think I had, like, twenty dollars in my car and get you know gave it to her and, and she um I mean I just you know just I was just shattered and um and then she disappeared into the mist. I mean she was like a an angel sent to save my manuscript. Wow. And then I I I mean I can't even it was just mind blowing. So then um I, I get back into my car. I pulled. I pulled over to. I got out of traffic. I pulled over to a curb and called my agent and told her, told her what happened. I said, you know, like Kathy, you're like totally not going to believe this. And she, she goes, Deanne, I think you're done now. Remember, this is ten years later. And I could never figure out where to end the story. So, so that That's yeah, a, it was, what an amazing uh, story. Oh my gosh. I know. <laughs> So I feel like, um, you know, sometimes I joke to my friends that I'm changing my name to hashtag blessed. <laughs> like, it was, that was really one of those moments. Um, just incredible. Yeah. Oh, that's, thank you for sharing that. That's, that's so delightful to know. And it makes me think about how in the desert community you wrote about, there was so much violence and you know difficult stuff happening, but there was also a lot of community where people were helping one another. And I think about Debbie, Mandy's mom, and things she did to help both animals and people who were down on their luck, and how ultimately she created the scholarship fund in Mandy's name. And I wonder if you could talk about Debbie a little bit. She's such a compelling figure and, and share a little bit more about the scholarship. Yeah. What, what an amazing woman. I mean, you know, she had a lot of really rough breaks in her life and came from a legacy of poverty and violence and went back for decades it, you know, the Donner party was kind of, obviously that was a, you know, we all know that story. That was a difficult crossing, but from then on the family had, you know, ran into a lot of problems, and um, uh, her, her uh, um, you know, there was a lot of drinking involved, and, and, and the women and her, her mother and, and, and grandmother, had, you know, were involved with with roughnecks. I'll put it that way. Um, and uh, you know, it's very hard to 
to break out of that. But she is, she, you know, very spirited and, and witty and um, loves animals. And um, one amazing thing she told me was that when she when um, she rescues pit bulls and when the at one point when their family uh, pit bull Corky was, was disturbing a neighbor in Twenty Nine Palms, somebody called um, animal control, and um, Debbie insisted on going to jail overnight in place of Corky, and she did. So I thought that was quite quite amazing. And then the story about the one thousand dollars scholar one thousand dollar Mandy Scott scholarship fund is fund is really inspiring. One of one of the most amazing things I've ever heard. Um, she was had been work Debbie had been working as a bartender in 29 Palms for quite some time and, and getting by on tips and so on. And um, after Mandy was killed, she decided to to organize a, a scholarship fund in the name of her daughter to help an average girl get out of town. I mean, think about it. That's all it would take, a thousand dollars. And so people were donating like matchbook collections and food stamps and, um, uh, you know, all manner of, of coins and, you know, any possessions they could that had any value at all. And she was able to raise, to put the $1,000 together. And um, then at the, one of the best parties I've ever been to. She there was a bar party um, to award the scholarship, and there was a band called the Velvet Hammer playing, and um, you know a very wide range of Mandy's friends were there. Um, Debbie always said that Mandy was like a mini UN. She had, you know, she had a very diverse circle of friends, and that's something that wasn't fashionable or happening in very many places at that time. This was, you know, during the nineties, um, you would see it more often in military towns and in the military than, in, than elsewhere, but still that just, it was not, it was just not going on the way it is now. I mean, nobody, hardly anybody would even discuss it. Um, but Mandy's friends and this, the group of girls I write about in 29 Palms, Debbie referred to them as the lunchbox gang because they used to have lunch at her house during lunch break from junior high. And they were, you know, Filipino, Latino, Samoan, black, white. So, yeah, they were a mini UN. And anyway, at any rate, they all, Mandy's friends came to this bar party. And I'm talking about not just like, this sounds kind of innocuous when I say the lunchbox gang, but I'm talking about like, you know, people who are on the, that whole circle, there were like Crips, Bloods, Marines, um, members of other gangs, bikers. I mean, this was like, there, were all, there was a very wide and interesting range of people who came together in a, in community around Mandy. And, you know, that, that was just some, that was palpable. It was really something I saw and you could feel I felt it as I moved through this story. It was obvious. So that she brought, they all came together at this to give away this $1,000 scholarship named after Mandy Scott. And um, to win the prize, somebody, a local girl had to write an essay about what she would do with that $1,000. And it went to a friend of Mandy's who wrote a really beautiful essay about wanting to come back and help people That's, you know, later in her life. Do you know whether she did that? I was curious to know whether she lived out those plans. I could never find out. I've been, I've wondered too. I could never find out, but certainly Mandy's other friends have carried on in her name. I mean, they've named their children after Mandy. Um, they've Mandy loved to dance. They teach their kids to dance. Um, she liked reading. She was the town babies, babysitter. I mean, they really take care of each other, the, the kind of community I've seen, you know, among this group of castaways is, you know, pretty astonishing. So our time is almost up, but I would love to hear you say a little something about the enduring legacy of this book. And you know, we're celebrating its 20th anniversary and it's 
as I mentioned earlier, has had such profound impact on the world, the literary world and the, the world in general. Um, you know, as I mentioned, this book led to the, the making of that cold case um, against the same Marine. And I, I'd just love to hear your thoughts about its enduring legacy. Um, okay, before I get into that, I just want to say Tony has one more song to do too. Yes, yes. And okay, we'll, we'll close don't... out with that. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, oh, it's enduring legacy. Um, well, a couple of kids, uh, they're you know, grown ups now, but I mean, uh, shortly after my book came out, told me that they, that because of what I wrote, they wanted to go to college and become writers. So that was, you know, that was, it was really nice to hear. Um, they felt that one of them told me that it was the first time anybody had listened to the, to that group of kids, had, the, the first time anyone had taken them seriously. Um, so, I don't know, I feel sort of funny talking and saying these things out loud, but it, yeah, you know, that, it was, it was nice to hear. Um, uh, I still, I hear from, I hear from other victims of the uh, Marine who killed the girls. He had a history of sex crimes before he joined the Corps. While he was in the Corps, he raped the daughter of a Sergeant Major. That was six weeks before he murdered Mandy and Rosie. And then there was this cold rape case. He had a long history of sex crimes. And I, you know, to this day, I hear from women who are just discovering my book now. And they're like, oh my God, I can't, I, that guy, I was assaulted by that guy, you know, 25 years ago. That was the guy. And I've also heard from Marines who were in the Corps with him talking about it. Um, so it, it resonates that way. Um, you know, which is, which is, it's pretty amazing. Um, so I think, I mean, it's something I always tell my students, just try to, you know, if you feel compelled to tell a certain story and that something wants you to bear witness, you know, just do it. <laughs> I mean, you uh, you don't know where the trail will lead. I certainly didn't. It wasn't like I was thinking, I'm going to take 10 years and work on this. Um, I just, there were these rivers that converged and I just knew I had to follow yeah. all the currents. Well, I'm so grateful you did. And I'm so grateful that we're able to celebrate that journey today. So thank, thank you, you so much, Deanne. Thank you, everyone who is here today. And thank you to Romans for hosting us. I love Romans so much, and I'm so delighted to be doing this event through your wonderful store. Um, a happy Independent Book Store Day, everyone. And we're going to have Tony close us out with one more song inspired by this amazing 20 year old book. So take it away, Tony, and thank you so much. It's called The uh, Silver Quarter Man. <laughs> There's a boy sitting on the creek Looking up beyond the sky He may break, but he won't cry Holy and poison leaf Grows like a weed up down the street Here's a path to a number four. He's been here many times before. In your heartache to me, sit in the dirt to 
Thank you so much, Tony. Yeah. And thank you again, Deanne. Thank you again, Romans. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And uh, you can click the link below to, to get Deanne's book, and I think some of mine, too. Um, <laughs> and, um, yeah, thank you again. Happy anniversary, Deanne, of this book. Happy Independent Bookstore Day. Uh, Thank you so much, Gail. That was beautiful. Just really an awesome experience. And Tony, too. Uh, my, I, I'm just blown away by all of this. Okay. Hey. See you all later. Yeah.